Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Six weeks ago today, we presented phase one of a $400 million economic relief and recovery package to help employers survive this pandemic and build a foundation to grow and thrive in the future. These funds came from the Federal CARES Act, which was packed by Congress for exactly these purposes. Although we ended up with less than I requested and more strings attached, I do appreciate the legislature's efforts over the past several weeks, and I look forward to working with them to do all we can to save businesses and jobs throughout the state. Now, it's important to note that some of the funding was in the bills passed last Friday night, uh, which haven't gotten to my desk as yet. So to be clear, today we'll be talking about the grants in S350, which I signed on June 19th. Mr. Goldstein will go into detail about who qualifies and how to apply, but rest assured, I've instructed my team to make the process as easy as possible in order to get the money out the door quickly to those who are in need. For example, even though there are several programs for different sectors, we've created a single point of entry for those applying for or looking for information. I've also instructed the Agency of Commerce to host a series of webinars to help applicants and answer questions as well. Now, for those employers listening, of all sizes and in all parts of the state, the fact is, even though we've begun a cautiously and methodically reopening our economy and putting more Vermonters back to work, I realize that many of you, especially our small businesses, are still on the brink of ruin. Family businesses have been around for decades and still don't see a path out of the red. Young entrepreneurs and innovators who just months ago had so much hope have had to put their work on pause. Many restaurants, cafes, breweries are struggling to pay their rent. Employers who care deeply about their employees are wondering when they can bring them back, or worse yet, whether they can even open their doors again. I understand the challenges this pandemic has caused through no fault of your own. I helped grow a small business for over 30 years, so I know how devastating and helpless it would be to see my life's work crumble right before my eyes and not know what to do to fix it or how long it will take to get things back to normal. And the fact is, our businesses and their employees from hard-hit sectors like tourism and hospitality drive our economy, put food on the table of Vermonters. They pay taxes. And let's not forget all the contributions they make to help their, their communities. Helping these businesses survive right now is essential. Our many jobs won't come back and will face a long-term economic crisis. And state and local governments will face budget gaps for years to come. Even though this economic relief will help, I know it's not enough. And recovery will be long and hard. But we've seen the strength of Vermonters and what a powerful impact we have when we stick together. Please know that my team and I will continue to turn every knob, pull every lever we can to help families and businesses survive and recover from this crisis so we can thrive in the future. Before I conclude, I, I want to especially thank and recognize those employers and their teams who went the extra distance and found creative ways to keep their doors open while keeping everyone safe. I'm so impressed with how this state responded to this once in a century challenge. Let me close by reminding Vermonters as we head into the holiday weekend, we must continue to take personal responsibility for preventing the spread of this virus. This means avoiding large groups and crowds, maintaining physical distancing, washing your hands a lot, and wearing a mask whenever you're in public and cannot maintain physical distance. This is literally in our hands. We all have a role to play. And if we do our part, we can prevent the spread of the virus and help get things back to normal. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Goldstein to share more details about the programs. Thank you, Governor. 
The Agency of Commerce and Community Development and the Department of Economic Development have been working tirelessly over the last few weeks to propose and work with the legislature, legislators on an economic relief and recovery package. At the legislature, we advocated for the business community and urged the legislature to act quickly to get immediate financial support to businesses to help them survive. As the governor mentioned, our initial proposal was altered significantly by the legislature, but with each step, the entirety of our internal team at ACCD and DED have been all hands on deck to create a grants portal application and management system from scratch in order to process these grants in a quick but responsible way. Today we are happy to announce that the path forward to getting this money into the hands of Vermont businesses in need. Just 12 days after the signing of S350 and five days after the passage of H966, which is headed for signature. The Economic Recovery Grants Program application process will open on Monday, July 6th. The program will be administered in a couple of ways. If your business files rooms and meals or sales and use tax, you will apply through the My VTAX portal at the Vermont Department of Taxes. These grants primarily support the most hard hit sectors of lodging, restaurants, and retail. All other private businesses and nonprofits will apply through a new grant management system set up by ACCD over the last week. We realize there are a lot of moving parts to the multiple pieces of legislation that have been passed over the last few weeks with different implications for different sectors. The legislature also created many carve outs for specific organizations, which may leave many businesses confused on how to access these much needed grants. Given that confusion, we hope the resource center that we've set up at the Vermont, at the accd.vermont.gov website will work as a central place to direct businesses to the right application, whether they are a rooms and meals taxpayer, a nonprofit, a private business, a women or minority owned business, or a business that has suffered either a 50% loss or 75% loss during any one month period from March through August when compared with the same month in 2019. The grants will be allocated on a first come first served basis and the maximum grant award, whether going through tax department or through ACCD will be $50,000. Each business or organization applicant may only receive one grant. The formula for the grant awards is also on our website. It is our goal to distribute these funds as quickly and as seamlessly as possible within weeks of an approved application. There are a few exceptions we want to make sure Vermonters are aware of. The recovery grant programs for healthcare and agricultural businesses will be administered by the Agency of Human Services and the Agency of Agriculture, respectively. They will not be processed through ACCD or the Department of Tax. Details on those programs will be forthcoming from those agencies in the weeks ahead. There is also a Working Lands Enterprise Grant Fund program that will not be implemented through ACCD. I do want to remind everybody that many of the details of these grants came together at the 11th hour of the legislative session last Friday. So we are continuing to work through what they have passed and trying to ensure our system works for all businesses. There may be a hiccup or two along the way. It is a systems development project, which typically would take months, and we've done it in weeks. But we know businesses need the support as soon as possible, and we are working to make that happen. Again, we plan to open the application process on Monday, July 6th, but we strongly encourage businesses to go to our website, accd.vermont.gov, to get guidance on how to prepare so that you have the proper documents ready ahead of time you know what the eligibility requirements would be and more information about the grant formula and process so that businesses are prepared when we launch. ACCD will be hosting a, some, a webinar tomorrow afternoon, July 2nd at 3 p.m. Information for accessing this webinar is also on our website. We realize that these grants are not enough to make businesses whole, but we do hope that this influx of cash can help them survive as Vermont continues to reopen in the months ahead. I will now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. I'm going to provide a brief update, talk a little bit about testing, and talk a little bit about sources of outbreaks. Did not bring my screen this morning because 
two days ago since we last met. There were zero cases on one day and two cases on another. So not a lot to report over the Vermont cases. In terms of the Vermont outbreaks, the two predominant ones that we're following, Burlington, Winooski, and Fairhaven, there have not been any new cases in seven days. Winooski stands at 114 cases, a total of 222 involved, meaning cases, contacts, or contacts that turned into cases. Fairhaven continues to stand at 12 cases, only two of which are Vermont, 22 total involved. Additional information about that small outbreak is that uh, as it was a workplace outbreak, all are adults, median age 35, and a 50-50 mix symptomatic or asymptomatic. Moving on to testing, our rolling seven-day test average has been 1245 with over 8,700 total tests done in seven days. When we look at all of our counties, Vermont counties have had from slightly less than 6% to 11% of their population tested. Keep in mind that's a one-time testing um, and represents the status of an individual on that day that they are tested. We were heartened to see a report from NPR and Harvard Research yesterday that reported four states where uh, testing was occurring at a sufficient level to actively suppress the virus. We were one of the four states. The other three were Alaska, Hawaii, and Montana. Lastly, I'm frequently asked at these press conferences, actually, about the source of outbreaks and, cl and clusters. And I've stated um, that it's very challenging work. Frequently, we're unable to provide an answer. I want to provide a more national perspective on that, because yesterday, in its weekly uh, update called MMWR, the CDC published a study on the characteristics of adult outpatients and inpatients with COVID-19 from 11 academic medical centers across the country. They interviewed a total of 350 patients, and much like we are doing in our contact tracing, went back 14 days in their histories. Out of those 350, only 46% reported recent contact with a COVID-19 patient. So that's under 50%. The majority of the contacts were, as you might expect, either within families, 45%, or work colleagues, 34%. So needless to say, their conclusions were, because cases frequently lack known contact, the process of case investigation contact tracing and isolation are critical to limit community transmission. And more important than ever become the concepts of physical distancing and mask wearing, especially from this study in the workplace. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Commissioner Goldstein, we'll turn it uh, over to questions at this point. Ms. Calvin? Um, thank you, so it's Mike Dean. Question for Commissioner Goldstein. So in the application process and um, the process for rolling out these grants, um, what sort of internal mechanisms uh, does the state have to make sure that there won't be fraud or waste or abuse within the design? Yes, there will be a um, unique identifier. So. Uh, Applicants will need employee identification number, also their Vermont tax identification number. And there's a way that we could cross-reference to ensure that the applicant is indeed kind of the owner of that number. Um, and I feel, thank you. 
Stewart. Governor, can you um, speak to the hazard pay uh, provision that I guess is headed your way, the $1,000 a month for two months? Um, is that is that need your approval? Yeah, we're still sorting through that. Let me uh, refer to Secretary Smith on that. Um, it's uh, it's uh, for healthcare workers at this point, frontline healthcare workers. I'm not sure uh, how it uh, works. So it hasn't. Re I don't believe I've received that one yet. Um, but uh, but we'll take a look. Secretary Smith. Stuart, we're putting the mechanisms in place right now. As you know, we did do some distribution of uh, monies for. Um, essential workers hazardous pay during the height of the pandemic for uh, designated agencies and uh, specialized services agencies. We expect that it will be similar to the process. This is much broader, of course. It talks about nursing homes. It talks about all other aspects of, uh, of health care and, and uh, those people that are on the front lines. But I suspect we're going to be rolling out um, uh, various announcements here in the next few weeks about how these various programs are going to be work. We have the health, the healthcare stabilization fund, uh, which I hope to announce in um, a week or ten days of when that's rolling out and the application process for this. And we'll also be talking about the hazardous. Um, the hazardous pay provision as well. The two separate things, but we'll we'll combine them in in one sort of announcement. And if I could follow up on the um, national um, spread now, 31 states have seen a huge spike, and there's a lot of conversation about whether we should need a national policy on on face masks. You've addressed this, I know, a number of times, but is it time or beyond time for a national policy uh, for our face masks? Well, again, you know, a national policy would uh, would be easier to adhere to uh, than having it done uh, sporadically. Uh, but uh, but I have to say, you know, we look at our numbers and how well we've done, and look at the low positivity rate, and we're one of you know the the number of cases in Vermont we're we're fourth in the nation, uh, and we have uh, you know a lot of accolades in terms of our testing and so forth. We have a very robust testing and tracing program as as uh, uh, Commissioner Levine uh, had just talked about. Um, so I feel good about where we're at. Uh, but we're going to continue to push forward. I think wearing, you know, for all those listening, uh, wearing a mask when you can is a good idea. Uh, it's altruistic. It helps others. Uh, I do it. I think many people do. And we need to keep this effort up. We'll be uh, engaging in a campaign here uh, in the next uh, weeks to come. Uh, it has already begun, actually. And uh, we want to make sure uh, that the people understand why uh, and do it willingly. Um, because when you try and, you know, just mandating, uh, as they're seeing in other states uh, across the country, doesn't make it so. It doesn't make it happen. Uh, there's a lot of uh, friction, controversy, um, like a defense mechanism, uh, the government telling you what to do once again. Uh, I would rather uh, educate, lead, and inspire people to do the right thing. And right now, this is a good thing to do when you can uh, in those conditions where you you can't physically distance yourself from someone else or you don't have a, a health uh, condition that, that prevents you from wearing a mask because some people just can't wear one. So uh, I think we're doing the right thing. We'll try this uh, and uh, we'll see where it takes us. We also, uh, you know, we have mandated for those riding uh, uh, public transportation uh, to wear masks. We did that a number of weeks ago. We also allowed for um, communities, uh, cities and towns uh, to do it on their own if they, if they want to restrict further, which some have done, a handful. Um, but uh, giving that latitude, I think, uh, has given us, again, uh, a way of approaching this that may be different from other states. but. But we can't uh, can't argue with the numbers. All right, uh, moving to the phones, Mike Donahue, the Islander. Good morning, uh, Commissioner Curley. Following up on Stuart's question, uh, Fleet Fire Rescue have been on the front lines since day one. 
in the Herald, Rutland Herald reported a case impacting several police officers in Rutland City during an arrest. I'm wondering if you can give us some numbers as far as how many police departments, how many fire departments, how many rescue squads, and the personnel that have been sidelined due to positive tests from COVID-19. Thanks for the uh, question, Mike. Um, we have actually been asking uh, departments to uh, provide that information on a, a daily or, or several times a week uh, basis. Um, and there have been very few reports, actually so few that we have not tracked the overall number. So I can uh, check with the folks that may have that information and get back to you. If, if, if any Vermont state troopers to set your department, uh, I assume you know, any of them been sidelined uh, during this time? No, not that I'm aware of. And, and we have been, uh, we've been uh, up until just a few weeks ago, we were tracking daily um, sick time and trending just to, to ensure that we weren't seeing any unusual trends and we did not uh, find any. Great, thank you very much. Wilson, the AP. Uh, good morning. I have two uh, questions on completely different topics. The first one, uh, Secretary French, what do you make of the, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, school funding decision out of Montana? There are some, admittedly, the advocates who say that uh, this could start requiring Vermont to uh, start sending money to religious schools. And secondly, uh, for Commissioner Levine, I saw some reports recently about it, just in the last few minutes, actually that all this testing surge, if you want to call it a surge, uh, could create another shortage in testing equipment or supplies. And those are my questions. Uh, this is uh, Secretary French. Thank you for the question uh, regarding the Montana decision. Um, honestly, I haven't had a chance really to evaluate the decision or to uh, determine its applicability to Vermont. You know, it's, the decision is based on a, a circumstance in Montana and specifically uh, their constitutional construct, which is no doubt different for, than Vermont, but haven't had a chance to evaluate its uh, relevance to Vermont yet. Okay, thank you. On the second part of the question, I just, um, I was on the SEOC call this morning, the State Emergency Operations Center, and this subject was brought up. Apparently, uh, they are going to be diverting some of the uh, testing supplies to the hotspots uh, that are erupting throughout the country, uh, understandably. Um, but uh, but I was uh, uh, I was told uh, during the briefing uh, that uh, we had a 52 day supply at this point in time. So I think it's good news for us where uh, we can continue at the pace where when we've increased the testing uh, capacity, uh, we're, we're averaging over a thousand a day at this point. And it appears we can continue to do that uh, for the next 52 days without any supplies coming in. But we are going to further uh, trying to to replenish our supplies uh, through other means. And, and I believe at some point we'll be getting uh, supplies back from the government as well. Dr. Levine. Just to add to that good news. Um, so the, the principles that we're really operating under, principle one is to have diverse platforms. So not just one way to test on the PCR test for the virus, but multiple ways. So our public health lab has two platforms. UVM has several platforms. Plus there are the commercial labs, which actually use different platforms. Um, so all of those platforms require different sets of reagents and uh, equipment to, to do the assays. So that principle we've really tried to adhere to here. Uh, so we wouldn't be overly dependent on one. And then if we lost the supply, we're like dead in the water. Um, Second uh, principle really is that um, we work with the federal government um, and really allow them to uh, help us as much as they can, but recognize that they have other priorities too, so we can't be totally dependent on that supply chain. So as the governor just said, um, one of our platforms that we use a lot of is um, the spigot is being turned the wrong way. And the only way we'll, we will be able to get more of that supply is actually working with the manufacturer themselves as opposed to working through the federal government. 
So we already have channels open to try to accomplish that. And then I guess the third thing is the concept of uh, stockpiling. So you heard we have a 52-day supply, and obviously that's at the rate we're currently doing. If something happened and we needed to vastly increase that rate, it would give us less days, but we'd still have the capability of doing all of that testing. So making sure we have enough on hand, because this is going to be important for many, many more months, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay, I thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Wilson. Avery, WCAS. My question is for Secretary French. Are school districts holding summer school either online or in person this year, and how is the state following up to ensure safety guidelines are met? Yeah, hi, thank you for the question. Yes, we put out guidance at the beginning of the summer um, to give you know districts the necessary guidance to open summer school, um, and districts are, are allowed to do that. I think it's uh, you know it's a voluntary issue. Um, what I've noticed is some districts have taken that on, where others are more concerned, uh, particularly around the public uh, safety uh, health issues around doing that. Uh, so it's been very uneven. I think statewide, it's certainly been different than typical summer programming. Uh, but I would also say that, you know, summer programming includes lots of different types of programs, not just remedial academic programs, but also recreational activities and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, communities are doing their best um, in terms of navigating um, their options and uh, working with their local community partners to provision those programs. Um, we do not have um, any mechanism really to supervise that per se. We do have oversight of a program that we call 21st century community programs um, that we do have some uh, to more direct control over, but for the larger number of programs out there, we're not, we're not supervising uh, their implementation necessarily. And just a quick follow-up for you and to Governor Scott. Um, Senator Ash and the Vermont NEA are calling for a school reopening task force uh, to be used to develop some strategies for the fall. What is your response to that? Well, maybe, maybe I can start and uh, let uh, Secretary French finish up. Um, you know, Secretary French has been leading a steering group uh, for quite a number of weeks, I think since April, uh, to contemplate uh, how do we reopen. Uh, there have been many, many people at the table, um, experts from every field, uh, those in uh, the pandemic uh, community, uh, those, uh, those who have the expertise in, in that area, as well as uh, from the NEA themselves. I think there was probably four representatives uh, that were involved in this since April. They meet uh, every single week uh, and have been going through uh, some of these guidelines and, and doing, uh, doing a lot of good work. Um, I, th I thought it was unfortunate uh, that two days after the legislature uh, had adjourned uh, that uh, they, they called for uh, more oversight. Uh, I would have thought uh, the committees of jurisdiction in the House and the Senate in education uh, might have wanted to check in and if they'd had some questions about how we were moving forward because we announced uh, we were going to open up um, uh, again two or three or four weeks ago. Uh, so this is no surprise. Um, but, um, but I would have thought that the committees of jurisdiction would have had some interest as well in what we were going to do in September. So again, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, this is politics. It's a, it's a campaign year. Uh, there's a series of elections in November and August. So um, we'll, I'll leave it at that. But uh, Secretary French, uh, maybe go into detail about who is in the meetings and how many times you've met. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, yeah, I, when I received uh, Senator Ash's letter, I mean, my first reaction was I, I wasn't convinced that he was aware of some of that other activity going on. So in my response to him, I did try to lay out a description of the governor did of, of what has gone on uh, previously. But we have had a, a regular group meeting every Friday um, consisting of members of the, the Superintendents Association, the Principals Association, uh, the Independent Schools, School Nurses Association, Vermont NEA, as the governor mentioned, has figured prominently in that work. Uh, the Vermont Council of Special Educated Admi Education Administrators, uh, pediatricians, pediatric infectious disease experts from UVM, um, school psychologists, uh, state director uh, of our National Association of uh, Directors of Pupil Transportation, so the student transportation folks. Uh, folks from the agency um, and, of course, the expertise from the Department of Health. So we've had a large group involved in designing the guidance. I guess, you know, the, uh, 
certainly interested in, in the proposal to a certain extent, but I, my thinking now, uh, having been a superintendent um, and involved in sort of implementing guidance, so I think we, we're turning the corner now where we have to be focused on the implementation of the guidance. Uh, I think the guidance has, has stood up very well, um, both uh, from state review and national review. It's considered high quality, um, and I'm certainly interested in working uh, with school districts uh, you know, across the state to understand uh, how to implement the guidance. So, um, we're going to be focusing our efforts on implementation. Um, so it, to me, it's, it remains an open question to what extent uh, such a committee uh, would already supersede work that's going on. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, to what extent would it support the practical implementation of the guidance? Because that needs to be our focus right now. Thank you. Greg, the county courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, I want to start uh, with a quick update. They, uh, I don't know if you had a response. Somebody asked the other day if the guard was still going to be called up. Is that uh, in something we have an answer on yet? I, I believe uh, so. I did uh, reach out to General Knight and uh, and referred him to. And they, in fact, they had a uh, Facebook Live event. I think it was last night or the night before to talk about all different types of issues with the guard. Um, um, so I. I we, I put him in the right direction. I believe he answered that. Um, but I, I uh, from what I gather, it was the alert status uh, date uh, that was in question that might have been delayed. Uh, but that doesn't delay the, de the deployment, I don't believe. So probably a better question for him just to, to clarify. And I can have him uh, contact you, Greg, uh, directly uh, if, uh, if need be. Uh, but it was a, a terminology. Uh, that something has been delayed, but it doesn't uh, delay the whole uh, deployment. Okay, I can reach out to the tag. Um, in my question, kind of for today, uh, seeing that we're five months in, I, I understand that you don't want to give away timelines because they change. Um, but without giving away a timeline, how far ahead are you and your staff planning? Um, and, and I'm thinking, um, like, are, are you, I know you're responding to the numbers, but do you have plans, you know, months and, and years out, or are you looking just, you know, in the next couple weeks? No, I mean, we, we plan out uh, much further than that, uh, obviously, with the, uh, go, the colleges, uh, universities coming back in in uh, September. Uh, that's been part of our planning uh, opportunity, as well as the K through 12 public schools and private schools. Uh, throughout Vermont, so we're planning for that. Um, and we're looking ahead, you know, we're trying to contemplate what's going to happen. Again, once we can get to everyone to a 50% opening, uh, which was our, our goal, uh, is, uh, and then try to continue to watch the numbers and open the spigot just a little bit more uh, every week or two uh, to and, and pay attention to the numbers and make sure we're not opening too fast. But uh, but you know, we, we look out uh, obviously with some of these uh, these events uh, that are coming up uh, to, to contemplate for that, as well as when it you know it starts getting colder. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know we watch other uh, other states, uh, other states around the country, but in the region in particular, and what's happening with them. It's good news right now, uh, but uh, but who knows? It was good news in in some of those in California, for instance. It was good news about two weeks ago. But not so good news today, as well as with Arizona, and uh, Texas, and uh, and maybe Florida. Uh, so that can change quickly, uh, and obviously, uh, we don't want to uh, get too far out over our skis here. Uh, but we're doing pretty well in the state, and we want to uh, continue to make sure that we're keeping people as safe as possible while opening up just as quickly as we can. I think the big, you know, a big, uh, you know, I, I will add as well, as particularly for your region, Greg, as you're probably more aware than, than most. Uh, once the border is opened up uh, with, uh, with Canada, uh, that's going to increase trade. There's going to be more people coming into the state, uh, which is desperately needed for your region in particular. Uh, appreciate that. So what is the, the farthest out you're, you're looking at this point? Um, you know, you have to get more specific. Like, what is it that you'd like? Uh, like well, I'm, I'm just curious. Are, are your contingency plans, are they set, you know, two years out, assuming you're reelected? Are they, 
are, are you kind of capping it at six months? Are you capping it at, at a year? Like, I, I'm just curious how far has the planning goes on this sort of response? Well, again, you know, we've we've done this all without a playbook uh, thus far. So we've developed the playbook uh, as we move forward. Uh, so we'll continue to do what we've been doing. And if uh, something happens, I mean, we try and, you know, we have to look out uh, every single day. I mean, every day I wake up uh, and write down all the numbers of all the region, uh, regional uh, uh, states uh, and what, what's happening with them, watching what's happening throughout the country, watching what's happening across the world, and then uh, trying to, to uh, make sure that we're, we're still, you know, adhering uh, to our good, um, our, our small positivity rate uh, in our tracing efforts and so forth, and just just constantly monitoring what's going on in our state and making sure that we're not uh, going in the wrong direction. So, you know, it's twofold. Um, obviously, we want to get back to normal. Uh, we want to get back to 100% opening. Um, I, it, you know, it's just really hard to say at this point, but I think we've moved along reasonably well uh, over the last uh, couple of months. But, but it does give you a pause when you're seeing other states who thought they had it in hand as well. Uh, you know, Arizona in particular, uh, they went ahead and, and uh, opened up when they thought it was over. They, they had somehow missed it. And now it's affecting their state and their economy, Texas and Arizona, and having to um, actually revert and close things down, which I do not want to do. Uh, if we have to, if we, we see the numbers change dramatically, we obviously we we do whatever is necessary to keep Vermonters safe. But at this point in time, because we've been so cautious, methodical uh, in doing so, we're on a good we're on a good course here. So um, I feel good about where we are, um, and we'll continue to monitor the situation and open up just as quickly as we can, and keep looking down the road just as far as we can. But but hard to know. I mean, who would have seen? I don't know if you saw. Um, you know what was happening in Florida, Texas, Arizona, California. Um, and, and then thought that was going to happen. I certainly didn't, but, uh, but maybe you and others did, but, uh, but I wouldn't have foreseen that happening. Thanks, Governor, and, and thanks for your time. Thanks for your uh, thoughtful response. All right, Ed, Newport Daily Express. Yeah, Governor, uh, good afternoon. And I'd just like to start, I mean, that's the, um, Legislature appears to be making quite a leap of faith by um, targeting $106 million in federal funds to fill the uh, revenue gap in the education fund. What will happen if the, if the uh, federal government says, no, you can't do that? If, you, if we keep the budgets as they are, it's my understanding that our our residential tax rate will rise from three cents to uh, by to twenty two cents. Yeah, you've got the so numbers. You fill me in on that. Yeah, you've got the numbers right. I mean, if we go to, you know, if we had to fill the hundred and something million dollar gap in the Ed Fund alone, I mean, if you if you just uh, had to backfill that uh, with property taxes, it would go up to you know almost twenty five twenty five cents, uh, which is you know we we can't do that obviously. Um, and, and as far as the leap of faith, I think what can happen in the education fund in particular, um, we've, uh, we've set the rate uh, now. Uh, we can continue through the rest of the year. Uh, we can deficit spend in some respects in the ed fund. Uh, maybe we wouldn't want to do that in every fund, but in this fund in particular, we could. Uh, but it would give us a little bit of time, a little bit of breathing room, because I still believe uh, that we're going to have to find ways to save money. We can't do this by raising taxes alone. We can't do it. We just, we're taxed to the capacity now um, and asking Vermonters to do more uh, during, especially during this time, this economic crisis that we're facing uh, today uh, would, uh, would just be um, not something that would be beneficial uh, to us as a state. So um, we have to look for another approach, but this does give us a little bit of breathing room. Uh, it's not immediate, um, but, uh, but again, I, there's going to be other there's other budget shortfalls as well in the in the general fund and so forth. Um, so to the tune of this could be, you know, it's gone down a little bit. Uh, at one point we thought it was going to be four to five hundred million dollars in in uh, in, uh, in total. 
uh, with the Ed Fund, uh, but it's now could be maybe two to three hundred uh, at this point with the with the Ed Fund as well. So we'll know a lot more uh, as uh, as we move forward, especially uh, getting to September, uh, let's say, and we'll know uh, better where we're at. But that's why we did this uh, with with the legislature's help. I mean, we we were uh, working together on this. Uh, to do a quarterly budget uh, to get us through this initial stage and then we'll figure out what the federal government is going to do and uh, whether there's any more money that is going to be coming uh, from the federal government and uh, and then just see what our need is at that point we'll have a better idea of the revenue sources but suffice it to say um, we are going to be uh, there's going to be a, a budget gap regardless of what happens so uh, I think we have to face it we're going to do it on uh, through the administration uh, as you know, um, I froze any uh, any raises in the executive branch uh, so that um, to give um, Vermonters a break and, and it just wouldn't be uh, the timing uh, is inappropriate for us to give give raises uh, to ourselves uh, in the administration in the executive branch. Um, so uh, we'll um, we'll continue to uh, do what we can l limit uh, the expenditures and uh, try and live within our means here. Very good, thank you. Kat, WCAX. Hi. So I was looking at the availability of pop-up testing and noticed that all of the pop-up testing appears to be booked in the state until July 13th. And if you look at the Burlington area specifically, if you want a pop-up test, you're going to have to wait three weeks until July 21st. Is there a discussion about adding more pop-up testing opportunities since there appears to be a lot of demand? But Dr. Levine. I'm glad you asked that now because uh, one thing I forgot to say in my opening comments um, when our team reported out today from the Burlington Winooski area, they were so heartened by the positive feedback they were getting from the communities that were being served by the pop ups that are happening pretty much every day uh, in those communities and the access to testing that they felt they might not have had but, but for the pop ups. So, um, it concerns me when I hear you say that there may be a uh, 12 days uh, period where someone couldn't obtain a test. Uh, we have an entire testing uh, team and task force that looks at this all the time. So I'll make sure that uh, they can verify that and see what contingency plans are being developed. Much as I talked about earlier from an earlier question about uh, not relying on one platform for testing. I want to expand that to talk about not relying on one site for testing either. Uh, the pop-ups are really ideal for two sets of circumstances, minimum of two sets. One set is someone without symptoms who wants to get tested uh, and that person may just want to know or that person may be a traveler who wants to on day seven try to uh, have a negative test and then not be quarantined anymore. And the other set of circumstances are these more special times when there's a focal cluster or outbreak in an area of the state where we want to provide more abundant testing to get a handle on that area and to allow the population to know uh, if they indeed are uh, at risk or not at risk. Uh, so those are pop-ups, but then there's obviously testing that can go on within our local health offices on a periodic basis around the state. There's testing that can go on in commercial enterprises and in doctor's offices and in the healthcare system. So what we're trying to do actively is broaden the portfolio so that there are abundant options for someone. Pop-up, local health office, their local hospital or uh, FQHC, uh, setting, which are, I want to say are doing a, abundant testing for us, uh, whether they want to go to Walmart uh, and whether we can expand the number of Walmarts. We're in active in discussions with pharmacies uh, that are national pharmacies to see if uh, they would uh, open up for business in Vermont like they've done in other more high, highly populated states. Um, so the, the number of options are quite abundant and our goal is to actually uh, provide as many of them as possible. 
So if someone says, you know, I can't get into one of those pop-up tests, but yeah, I traveled and I want to end my quarantine early, I want to go get a test, I don't have any symptoms, should they be contacting then their doctor's office? That would, that, that's always a, a good option, and we've been encouraging those in the healthcare system to actually be uh, offering the testing for those who have the concern that you just raised. Um, we also get a fair number of those calls uh, into our uh, operations center uh, and at the health department where we have people who can answer that and try to problem solve with the individual. And I noticed on the health department's website, the pop-up testing map goes through July. To confirm, will these pop-ups continue in August? I can't imagine us uh, stopping the strategy, uh, knowing that they have provided such an important outlet. Uh, so you've seen a schedule through July. I just don't think what has been developed yet that goes beyond that. And last testing question here. Um, are there ways to get the test results back faster? You know, like have any of those rapid results tests gotten good enough that the state would consider using them? So that's actually two questions. Let me, let me take the first because that again came through on our uh, SCOC and Health Operations Center meeting this morning that uh, there's, there's been an entire team assembled because of the concern about not getting negative results conveyed to people in a rapid enough time frame. And so there are extra uh, people who call the individual with the negative result so that they don't have to wait for the mail to arrive. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is um, we're still a little reluctant on the uh, point of care tests uh, from the Abbott machines based on the FDA themselves coming out and not fully endorsing those and cautioning the clinical community about the limitations. Um, but I do think there will be other uh, point of care platforms that could be utilized because it's such an active market right now. So our, our hope is that, that that would become another option. I've become aware of an option that's being used um, actually more locally here um, that I have some concerns about and we'll be discussing with those that are using it because a lot of these tests have come on so fast that in, in their zeal to allow us to use them, the FDA created these emergency use authorizations, which is fine when you're in a crisis like a pandemic. But now they're having time to go back and say, how do these tests really perform? And not all of them are actually passing muster on that, on that criteria. So we have to be very careful, uh, not just take something because it happens to be out there and available and marketed well, but we need to actually make sure that it's going to benefit the people who are seeking to use it. Thanks for all your questions. Thank you. Um, if I could just add, uh, Kat as well, and Dr. Levine you know, can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, if you can travel and you're from another community, you can sign up at, at different, uh, at, in different uh, locations. So you wouldn't have to be, for instance, from Burlington to get a Burlington test. Uh, you could go to Barrie or wherever else they're providing a test if there's, a, if there's a, a, an opening. So right. and that when people call into our system, we try to help them. Okay. And, and apparently they do try and help at the health department to provide them uh, with the tests at a different location. All right, John, BPO. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, question for the governor and then for Secretary French. Um, just to clarify, Governor, do, do you have all of the CRS bills the legislature passed um, on Friday night? No. Do you have possession? No? Yeah. They, uh, the speaker's office said they sent them over yesterday. Um, well, I, I, what I'm saying, I guess, is I don't, I don't have all the bills from, from Friday night that were passed Friday night. I don't have all of them now. Now, they don't all come from the House, it, as you probably know, John. If they, uh, if they're S bills, uh, Senate bills, they come from the Senate Secretary. If they're H bills, they come from the House, wherever they originated from. Okay. So, so some, um, I, we may have gotten all the House bills. I just don't know. Uh, but that doesn't mean we received all the Senate bills. Okay. Uh, and for Secretary French, um, 
U.S. Department of Education says that Vermont schools um, are in what they're calling needs intervention status uh, with regard to special ed. And they're saying Vermont got low scores for students with disabilities coming out of secondary education and in the length of time it takes to resolve complaints involving students and, and performance on national assessments, I guess, uh, for lagging as well. So I, I know special ed was a particular problem uh, with, with folks learning at, at home um, during this time period. And I'm wondering what you're doing or, or what the state's response is to this uh, elevated concern from the, from the Fed. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, it's not a, a concern we were unaware of, and, and we were expecting uh, to be elevated for the status and actually involve their, uh, and welcome their involvement in terms of technical assistance. You know, the issues basically boil down to data reporting uh, to a certain extent. In fairness to districts, uh, some of the measures that you mentioned, uh, they haven't received adequate feedback from the state level on their performance level. Chart. So we, I think we have the, uh, the issues well in hand, but. Uh, we are uh, sort of digging our way out of a several year uh, problem, um, but we have, I think, a good plan to do that and look forward to working with the federal government to uh, ensure that we have good oversight of our special ed system. Okay, and, and if I could, uh, for the governor on sort of an education or, or the task force related question, uh, are, are you saying that, that the pro tem was, was playing politics with the issue? I, I, you referenced the no. upcoming primary election. Well, I just think that it's just unfortunate that the, we were, they were in session last week and they've been in session since January. Uh, and we've known about this issue for a few weeks now. And to my knowledge, I don't believe the, the uh, committees of jurisdiction, uh, the education committees in the House or the Senate uh, have engaged on, the, on this. Uh, and then uh, we we adjourn and and then we get a letter. So I just think it's un unfortunate in some respects uh, that uh, we didn't you know engage earlier. Uh, although we've uh, we've heard about uh, some of the um, the the um, concerns that the NEA has, um, but uh, but again you know the committees of jurisdiction have been in session and and if they had concerns, um, they should have probably brought them to our attention so we could work them out. I, I also Sorry, would like think? to add, John, um, in terms of uh, special education, I think this just reinforces uh, the need uh, for us to get kids back to school uh, so that they don't slip through the cracks further, slip through the cracks. Um, this is, uh, you know, when you can in-person instruction, as we know, is, uh, is better uh, than what we've been facing over the last two or three months. So I think, again, this reinforces the fact that we need to get back to uh, to school in September. Okay, thank you. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for the governor. I, I was looking at figures today. Vermont continues to lag behind most of the country in responding to the 2020 census. We're something like 47 out of 52 jurisdictions. Can you speak to the state's efforts to get Vermonters to respond to the census going forward? Yeah, this has been a, a source of uh, contention and frustration for us. Um, we've had our director of uh, libraries heading this up. In fact, we had a uh, part of our press conference last week was on this very subject. Uh, it's risen to that level. You know, we're pleading with people, take five minutes, uh, fill out the census, call in. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's fairly easy to do. Um, so uh, we need this. This, uh, this has an effect on our budget. Uh, in terms of crisis, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, emergency declarations and so forth, uh, this has an effect on all of that. So uh, if, you, uh, if you're listening, uh, please, please take the time to fill out the census. It's just, it's just an easy thing for you to do. It takes five minutes. So are there any other efforts on, uh, by the state to get that message out? Because uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Yes, um, all kinds of efforts, um, and I can, I, I can get that information to you, and would, would love for you to, uh, to talk about it a little bit more in your area as well. Anything will help uh, in any one of, of those on the call uh, from the media sources, and I know some of you have, so it's been it's been helpful, 
uh, but uh, but we need more assistance here and we're doing all we can but we'll get you all the information that we have and if you have any ideas on how to how to get people uh, to uh, to engage um, we're all ears Sean, I can connect you directly thing. to uh, Jason Broughton, who's heading our, our census efforts. Colin Lane, VT Digger. Hi, good afternoon. Happy Canada Day. <laughs> With a closed border and everything. Uh, I know, it's tough to celebrate. Um, I was wondering if um, Commissioner Goldstein could talk about how the criteria for these grants. And um, I know there was talk of, you know, businesses showing a certain amount of losses to uh, qualify. It sounds like that type of criteria, has, they, that's not going to be part of it. So I'm just wondering, truly anyone can apply for that? Um, yeah, there are criteria, and that was one of the uh, problematic areas uh, where I believe in, in some areas they wanted 75 percent loss uh, where we had uh, we had asked for a little bit less uh, Commissioner Goldstein yes uh, thanks for the question so um, s350 uh, act 115 um, permits those with 75 percent loss in any one month from March through September as compared to any of 2020, as compared to that same month in the prior year, in 2019. And so that is what is effective right now. As soon as H-966 becomes law, then the requirement will be 50%. All you'd have to show is a 50% loss, the same time interval between March and September of 2020 as compared to 2019. You. Uh, have to be a business that does not have more than $20 million worth of revenue in any one given year. You need to have at least one employee, and um, there's a couple of other criteria, but you have to be have been in business before February of this year, and there are other criteria that have to do with use of CRF funds. So um, we have that listed on the site now, but hopefully that took care of your original question about uh, you do have to show a loss. You do have to show a loss. That is a requirement. And when does it switch over from 75% to 50%? What is the mechanism for that? As soon as H-966 becomes law, we will um, have that question in the system. It's been very, very challenging to kind of figure out how we do that. Uh, just so that you know, we were uh, working full steam ahead on 75% and uh, the bill was passed Friday night. It's virtually impossible to have that, you know, 100% ready right now as we speak, but we're working toward having that ready uh, in time for when the bill gets signed. It's just basically you'd have to answer two questions. And the $50,000 is sort of a one-size-fits-all type of thing, even if is there a certain threshold for how much you need to have lost in order to qualify for the 50000 For example, if you've lost 75 percent but your company was only making i mean is that is that also that sum is available to everyone the maximum is fifty thousand dollars irrespective so it's basically the formula is revenue times ten percent but with a maximum of fifty thousand dollars it's it's really just a way a mechanism we know that we're not going to have enough money for everybody so we need to put that in place until which time we could see if there is leftover funds, maybe we could reconsider. But at this point, that is our maximum. I see. And revenue times ten percent is sort of the guiding, Correct. the guiding amount. Correct. Uh, thank you, Governor Scott. I was wondering if you could talk about this masking campaign that you said you have plans. Yeah, um, maybe somebody from the Department of Health, um, or maybe Secretary Smith could talk to it. Uh, in more detail, but uh, we've been we've been working on this for uh, the last couple of weeks, and uh, I think they're rolling it out as we speak. Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you, Colin. Uh, the uh, masking campaign, the education campaign, as we'd like to call it, will be um, it's starting to roll out first. Sort of some aspects of it through the health department. 
Um, but here's what we're trying to do. Um, we're trying to make sure that Vermonters know the reasons why it's important to wear a mask. We're trying to make sure that they know what are the time, when should they be wearing a mask as, as we move forward. So we're going to do this on a broad platform basis. It's not going to only be the health department that rolls, rolls this out. It's going to be across state government. So you go to state parks, you'll see the message about masks. You, you see the road signs. You see some of the road signs now. But those messages will uh, continue to change. We'll have Vermonters talking to Vermonters about why they think it's important to wear a mask. What do they feel in terms of uh, why they think it's important to wear a mask? So it's going to be on a broad platform. We're going to roll it out. Um, you'll probably see the start of it um, this week and the sort of the general rollout next week on um, educating. Um, the aspects of the benefits of a mask and one of the things I think is um, essential is making sure that we hit all th those groups that um, may be reluctant to wear a mask and, and have them make that decision themselves that it's important for them to wear a mask based upon the information they're getting and the decision points that they make. Um, I think, you know, if you internalize it, if you socialize it, if it becomes important to you, you will do it. And that's sort of the basis of the campaign across all, all of state government. I, I, I got to say, the partners that we've partnered with, uh, the health department sort of having a critical role in this, but the partners like ACCD, um, uh, A&R, um, transportation, ag, um, have just been tremendous in helping us put this program together and then rolling it out um, in, in the next few days. And is the state buying TV time or Facebook ads or how are all these messages going to get out? They're going to go out through multiple platforms. Uh, what we'd like to see is Vermonters talking to Vermonters uh, and promote Vermonters talking to uh, to Vermonters about uh, the, the various aspects of wearing a mask, when to wear a mask, and how important it is. So we're going to use social media, we're going to use paid and uh, earned media uh, in, in a way, um, but that, those details in terms of the budget have not been rolled out. The, the camp have not been determined how much will go where, but it's definitely going to be social media. It's definitely going to be um, posters um, and those sort of things. And there will be earned and uh, paid media at some point. Uh, any sense of how you're going to gauge the success of this campaign? My understanding is the administration doesn't really have any data at this point on masking or social distancing compliance. And I'm wondering, without a baseline, how you sort of figure out whether this is effective in any way. We'll know it when we see it. I, I mean, I, this is a this is a campaign. Yeah, well, this is a this is a campaign that you will you you will see the results, and uh, we'll know it when we see it. That seems like a different way than you generally operate AHS. I mean, this is a data-driven administration. That's, that's a different approach to this issue, I think. I don't think it's any different. I, I mean, these are public awareness campaigns. And when you do a public awareness campaign, you, whether it's tobacco, I mean, we will eventually see the results of this, uh, of this campaign. Uh, we will see it in a whole host of, uh, of areas in a public awareness campaign. So, uh, you know, I. I, I am optimistic that Vermonters, given the aspect of why it's important to wear a mask, allowing them to socialize why it's important to them, because to many people, it's, it's a different reason. Whether it's, it's important that they keep their family safe, whether they keep their parents safe, whether they keep their coworkers safe. We have to make sure that we internalize it because as the governor said, if we don't do that, if we don't change sort of the social norms in wearing a mask, 
it, it's not going to make a difference whether you whether you have a mandated mask policy or not. It, 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 enforcing it is is almost impossible. So we're taking this approach where we really want to socialize it with the individuals, um, with Vermonters, and have them make that personal decision to wear a mask because it's good for their own interests. All right. Um, I have one more question, Governor Scott. Uh, Senator Leahy is speaking about now uh, in the U.S. Senate about uh, the USCIS furloughs. Um, his office has put a number on it, said there's 1,111 uh, in Vermont, and I'm just wondering, uh, asked about this a couple of days ago, but what sort of the administration is doing to help alleviate uh, some of the pain from it? Yeah, that, that's a number that I haven't heard uh, as yet in terms of that's the number of furloughed they're expecting, 1,105. Uh, one, 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 1,111. Of furloughed employees. Yeah, that's right. In, in Vermont, specifically. Um, we will definitely uh, contact Senator Leahy's office about this, but uh, obviously this is, uh, if that is uh, the correct number, uh, that would be, again, another blow to our economy. Uh, we're going to see uh, a number of these uh, of businesses uh, who are no longer going to be uh, able to operate. Um, we've already seen we have 40 to 50,000 people on unemployment uh, right now. Um, we're trying to reverse that trend. Uh, so obviously, the quicker we can get back to normal, the quicker we can open up the border, um, the quicker we can get people even in immigration back to work. So. Uh, we'll do whatever we can to assist them, as Secretary Curley had talked about earlier, um, or I think it was on uh, on Monday. Um, but uh, but again, we'll um, we'll check this out. I just don't know. I, I hadn't heard that number. I would be surprised if it was that high. Thank you for your time, Governor Scott, Secretary Smith. Guy Page. Governor, you were asked last week if you would veto the Global Warming and Solutions Act bill, if it gets to you. Uh, now have the House version with a million dollars in funding and a Senate version with no funding. Will your decision on whether to veto depend on whether the final version is funded or not? And, or are there other veto-worthy concerns there? Yeah, you, you know, we were, <clears throat> I think as I had stated earlier, uh, we were on a path where I thought we found consensus where we could uh, we could work together on this. Um, there is some problematic uh, areas in the bill in terms of funding and so forth, and and uh, and uh, I haven't taken uh, a look at it uh, at, at this point. Uh, but there's many areas that uh, that I have concerns on, over. Um, but uh, we will con I can contemplate that uh, uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Okay. Uh, also, one of your competitors for the GOP nomination has asked the city of Montpelier for permission to, to paint Liberty and Justice for All in red, white, and blue letters on State Street next to the Black Lives Matter street mural. Uh, what, what do you think of that idea? That sounds very patriotic, fitting for the 4th of July. Um, I wouldn't say it's inconsistent uh, with Black Lives Mat Matter a message. Uh, I think uh, they're almost one and the same. So. Uh, if the, you know, we're in a unique situation here in uh, in Montpelier, uh, where um, where the city of Montpelier obviously is the host for the capital, and they take care of the street uh, in front of the capital, and if they came to us uh, with another request uh, for another uh, type of message, uh, we would consider it. I don't see why we wouldn't do something of that nature if they if they saw uh, fit to pass it. Thank you. Uh, Governor, just, I'm sorry, to get back to the global warming solutions, what are some of the other issues besides the money that you have with the bill? Well, again, the lawsuit, um, you know, being able to sue the state uh, if we didn't meet mm -hmm. certain ben uh, benchmarks uh, is, is a problem for me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Brittany, Local 22. 
Hello. Um, just a quick question, um, and I know you touched a little bit on this on Monday, but you've said multiple times in press conferences in the past that, you know, Vermont is not an island. Uh, so we need to be looking at other states. And just with the, if you would say, it's an uptick in cases um, in other states, have, are you considering at all, you know, going back on, you know, tourism and inviting out-of-staters to come to Vermont? Uh, not at this point in time, uh, Brittany. Uh, the Northeast is looking much better. Almost every week uh, looks a little better. I watch, again, the numbers of New York uh, and uh, Massachusetts in particular, and they are doing much better than they were a week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So with the uh, metrics we put into place with our modeling and opening up safe counties, uh, we've been able to open up uh, tourism into Vermont by you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, we have seen an uptick in traffic, uh, which is good news uh, for the hospitality sector. And uh, when the border opens up uh, with Canada, which I expect it will uh, soon, um, or I'm hopeful it will, uh, that will you know, bring more trade in from the north uh, that others don't, uh, don't experience. I mean, we, uh, we seem to be a destination for many uh, in the Montreal area and in Quebec in general and uh, this would be beneficial for us. So um, at this point in time, uh, again, we're watching the numbers. I see no reason to, uh, to move backwards. Uh, in fact, we want to move forward. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Hi, uh, so um, Commissioner Levine will remember our conversation about commercial testing, uh, where it was mentioned that the only commercial testing site that you were aware of was the Walmart in Derby. Uh, that day, we were informed that Walmart was closing that testing site down for lack of interest, essentially. Um, I, uh, I guess that means to confirm that um, there are no commercial testing sites in Vermont. I also wanted to know, you know, what are the options for people who want to get tested in the Northeast Kingdom? Um, because the only pop-up site that we've seen so far uh, would, they are in St. Johnsbury, which can be kind of a schlep for people who are, uh, you know, in different areas of the Northeast Kingdom. Jeez, I, I... I don't know for sure what the schedule is, but I've seen uh, pop-up testing in Newport uh, as well, I believe. I've, I've even seen it in Island Pond, so I, uh, I believe we have done some testing, but maybe we're not on the schedule right now for that. Dr. Levine? Uh, regarding Walmart, uh, I'd be disappointed if that were true, uh, so I'll have to follow up on that because I know we've been talking with Walmart in general about expanding, not contracting. Um, the other part of commercial, though, that I've mentioned earlier today is pharmacies, where we're still actively engaged in those discussions. Um, but you're correct. There are no pharmacies currently uh, from the national chains that are offering that. With regard to the Northeast Kingdom, uh, there are a number of federally qualified health center sites, all of whom expressed uh, and follow through, actually, on their tremendous enthusiasm to do testing. Uh, and um, they're all available as sites uh, to be able to uh, access for those people living in the Northeast Kingdom. So it's not just relying on a pop-up that may not be there every week or every day or um, whatever. Um, the, the, the healthcare system that's part of the fabric of the Northeast Kingdom is actually um, providing testing. When it comes to these remote regions of the state, is there anything that the health department is considering doing differently to consider, uh, you know, the distance people might have to travel to get a test or? you know, containing an outbreak in a rural area compared to an urban area. Because sometimes rural areas have workplaces and, and family gatherings too. Yes, absolutely. So let's use Fairhaven as an example. Um, never had they seen a test site prior to having an outbreak 
and uh, even though people can travel to other communities like Rutland, like Bennington, they're not exactly next door and that would not be very convenient for them. Uh, so we worked with the town and uh, created a site uh, at a convenient time for those in the community to attend and we had almost 250 people get tested there. Um, so, so that's an example of what we would do in the setting of uh, a concern about a part of the state that was um, having an outbreak or even just needed access. Um, we're very responsive to that. Um, so the schedules that we set up are not, uh, they're strategic, if you will, uh, so that if there's a concern or a need, uh, we're certainly willing to work with those regions to, to accommodate that need. And do you have in the health department testing numbers broken down by a county or region? Yes, we have it broken down by county. Have you considered releasing them? You yes. know, as part of your data releases? Yes, literally I literally got them on my desk uh, 24 hours ago. Uh, so oh. so we, we will have them available. I, I look forward to checking those out. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonia Records. Uh, I'd like to express my interest for seeing those county by county testing numbers as well. So um, if when they are released, they could be done so uh, via the website, that'd be great. Yep. Um, I, I, I believe that's going Secretary. to be the case. Yeah, I believe that's going to be the case, Andrew. Excellent. Um, Smith, he mentioned last week the prison system was considering adjusting protocols for intake of new prisoners by possibly consolidating the quarantine activity to two facilities in the state. I'm wondering if that plan has been further developed and if so, uh, have you identified what facilities may be used for that purpose? Thanks for the question. We haven't identified what facilities are going to be used for that purpose, as I said last week we're looking at one or two facilities for the intake of uh, various prisoners. As I, as I had mentioned last week, our greatest threat is from the outside, not the inside. Um, by the way, we just uh, finished testing Marble Valley down in uh, Rutland again for the second time in, uh, in 10 days. Um, I think we're still just trying to sort out the various tests with names and making sure, but um, I think there was 198 tests, 197 of them are negative. The one, it doesn't mean it's positive, it's just they're making sure that the name is correct. That's both in, inmates and, um, and uh, correctional officers as well. We are, um, we are still in development of that uh, process on intakes into our system. I, I think you'll probably see we're trying to figure out how to sort of reduce travel um, between uh, the time that we have to transport from the, the arresting facility to um, a correctional facility. So you'll probably, it'll probably be a multiple of at least two facilities one in the north, one in the south, as we're, as we're looking at it. Um, but it hasn't been determined what those, who, where those facilities are located. I also want to just mention, we had mentioned last week that we're going to start rotating on a weekly basis, uh, testing uh, each week one facility. Uh, that will begin right after the holiday on July 6th. And that one facility that's going to be tested uh, next week will be Northwest. So uh, stay tuned on what facilities where we will um, we will do the intakes with in terms of quarantining uh, incoming uh, uh, inmates. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, another one uh, for uh, the governor, if I can. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, the, the threshold for qualifying for the grants was put a little bit higher than you had originally hoped uh, in terms of the losses. 
with it at 50%, are you concerned that there are businesses that, you know, maybe suffered a 40% loss that, that aren't going to be helped by this program and, um, and there's still a lot of economic pain to be felt out there? Yeah, you know, I'm concerned with all the businesses actually. Um, and in particular, I thought about all the businesses, some of the restaurants uh, who had decided to do whatever they could uh, to stay open, uh, curbside service and so forth and obviously uh, hurt their bottom line, but thought it was important to stay open. And I'd hate to see them penalize uh, in this way just by trying to stay open and having <clears throat> the revenue coming in, but, uh, but their bottom line is uh, fully depleted. Uh, and so I, I'm just concerned about some of those uh, businesses on the fringe, uh, so to speak, that are, that are really in danger of, um, or on the, on the brink of ruin, as I said before and uh, won't be able to, uh, to continue without some support. So uh, just w wanted to see some, as much flexibility as possible in doing that. But we have another, you know, we have another round to go. Hopefully we can get through this uh, and uh, we'll disperse. I have no doubt uh, we'll disperse all the money in this round and probably won't have enough uh, even at 50%. Uh, but uh, we'll go back to the legislature when they come back into session in August, September. And, uh, and if we see that uh, we need more uh, dollars, which I expect we will, uh, we'll be asking for that. Anything to- Do you have any sense? I'm sorry. Oh. I was just gonna uh, say, do you have any sense of how many businesses have permanently shuttered at this point and how many are at risk of doing I, so in the near future? Yeah, I don't know. It's only anecdotal. I just don't know. Uh, I think we'll sure. we'll learn more um, as we as this uh, this program unfolds, and uh, we'll get a better sense uh, when the numbers start coming in, and and uh, when we have these webinars as well. I believe we'll get some feedback uh, from many groups. Commissioner Golds. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Governor. I think you covered it really well. But I, what I just wanted to say that the difficulty and the enormity of this crisis is that. The losses are still unfolding. So unlike other disasters where you could capture a point in time and what the impact was, this is still alive. Uh, it's still with us. We have no idea if it'll get impacted again. But I guess to answer that question, we would have to know how many businesses do we know that could survive at 50% capacity? I mean, some of them struggle at 100% capacity. So it is very, dire situation and we would love more flexibility and we'll see what happens as we uh, as we start this process thanks and it, um, is that 50 percent uh, revenue loss offset by businesses that received ppp or some of the other um, uh, financial aid packages from previous efforts so no what we what we did and we had a significant amount of guidance on how to interpret the federal guidance and where we came out is that the subtract, we'll take revenue times 10%, subtract out any business interruption, interruption insurance proceeds, which we're pretty confident nobody received. And then um, the maximum is 50K. We are not subtracting out PPP, nor are we subtracting out idle, but there is sufficient warning and text about avoidance of duplication of benefit and all that means to an individual business is to ensure that you're not using these funds for things that you've already paid for from any of the other amounts that you've received. So we're pretty confident that since, you know, recipients will have until the end of December to pay these funds. And again, this is an ongoing crisis. So uh, we do think the losses outstrip and the need outstrips whatever assistance was available. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, John. Just following up on, on that, I was sort of literally back in the envelope, and at uh, one million dollar revenues, say that was the average, to be seventeen thousand businesses, and uh, I would guess that it'd be pretty hard to find seventeen thousand businesses that have suffered. Uh, Fifty percent loss. That is that is tremendously significant, as, as you had suggested. A lot of businesses are just barely making it one hundred percent revenue. And and you know what what is the the universe of of total companies uh, that we're looking at? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the entire number of businesses in the state is something like 70,000. Um, but uh, we think that, you know, we've done modeling with the tax department. That's how we arrived at our original ask. And we had originally asked for about $250 million worth of financial assistance. So we're working with a lesser number. Um, you know, I, we know going in, we're not going to be able to help everybody, which is a terrible position and feeling to go about doing this, but we're working with the team we have. I mean, this is what we have, and we have to make the best from it, but we are empathetic and understand that this is not going to help everybody, and it's not going to save everybody. And just to be clear on the money, the, the first package, as I see, was $70 million, and the second is a $100 million, so it's $170 million you're, you're able to work with at this point. Yeah, the way it'll break down is uh, the first, uh, the S3, the Act 115 funds are 50 million for tax and 20 for ACCD. And the second tranche uh, will be 56 for ACCD and 26 for um, tax department. So in total, it's kind of 76 each. Okay, a little bit less, yeah. Um, it it, the uh, PPP and the other programs also have some limitations, you know, on, on what you can pay for. Are these unlimited grants that once you get the money, other than the uh, thing you mentioned, uh, you could use it for anything? Yeah, it has to be related to the COVID, either the response or the impact or the costs or, you know, the losses. So it, it has to be directly uh, related to COVID crisis, um, but we're not lining up the exact, you know, that has to be this particular fixed cost or a variable cost. It, it, is, it is fairly broad. And when, again, it, it, um, when businesses could expect to actually, you know, going through the process the earliest they could expect to actually to get some money? Yeah, so we, we're hoping it'll be weeks and uh, we'll, we'll see. It's going to be dependent on volume. Um, so the greater the volume, probably the longer the time, um, but we're expecting to have kind of disbursements in, once a week. Oh, well, good luck on that. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Steve, NEK TV. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Um, thank you. Um, a, a couple for, uh, a couple for the doctor, maybe one for the governor, if I may. Uh, uh, Dr. Levine, I had a question from one of my viewers um, that said, uh, what direct proof do you have that face coverings reduce the risk of COVID? Dr. Levine. So there's a, actually a wealth of published studies they don't all agree, I have to be candid about that, but clearly they do agree on one thing, that if these are going to be protective, they are protective because they prevent large respiratory droplets from getting transmitted from one person to another. And the concept of how viruses are transmitted, respiratory viruses, the ones that cause respiratory symptoms and that are um, introduced into a person through their nose, mouth, or eyes. Um, that's well known over many viruses, not just the current coronavirus. So the um, data that we use is really much more um, long enduring data than just on the scene for this coronavirus epidemic. So it has to do with respiratory droplet transmission. Okay, and um, do you think it's coincidence that we're seeing uh, the waves of uh, new cases, particularly in the South and Southwest, uh, just weeks after the waves of protests? Or could it be uh, that in the Southern areas that uh, it's a result of uh, um, uh, spending more time indoors uh, in an air-conditioned environment. Yes, so, you know, there's been another analysis just done in the last couple days 
of all of the protests around the country. And though public health officials were in fear that this was going to set off the next wave, uh, the reality is uh, very hard to document abundant cases coming from protests. The consensus about what's going on in the South and the West um, is multifactorial, but things that are included are the fact that some of those states reopened pretty much all of a sudden and all at once to a very large extent. Some of that has to do with the younger age demographic congregating indoors and frankly not using facial coverings um, when they do so because they were in locations like bars and restaurants where they're talking and drinking and eating uh, so they wouldn't have facial coverings on and because the mass gathering size at those indoor settings was large. Again, um, it, it all has to do with how many people you're trying to get together and what size arena, if you will, and how much time they're spending in the activities that they're doing there. I think uh, people actually, this is not a study because it wasn't done as a clinical trial, but if you look at the difference between being inside, as we just were talking about, and able to transmit virus and not wearing a facial covering versus what we've seen countrywide, which is a lot of people outside engaging in active protests, but wearing facial coverings, I think that's good news for the facial covering uh, as a possible preventive for transmitting virus. So I think we should look at that very, very carefully. And if I could pick up on uh, the Secretary's earlier comments about uh, the campaign and the masks. Um, we all agree that you can't just tell people this is important to do, so just do it. Um, we never would have gotten anywhere in our country's history if that was the entire way we went about our business. If you look at the example of stopping smoking, if you look at the example of maybe not moving from alcohol to marijuana to prescription opioids, these are not things that people just see an ad and they go overnight, that changed my world and I'm going to definitely do what I need to do to stay healthy. These are behavior changes that really do take a, a fair amount of time and energy and uh, sometimes there's conscious thought, sometimes it's more subconscious, it's just you keep seeing it over and you suddenly it sinks in at one point based on an experience you've had. And we do have great data. We, sh sh we show that some of these campaigns reduce the number of people who are actively smoking. They reduce the amount of alcohol use in a certain age demographic, etc. cetera. Um, what we're asking for now, though, is so different because None of those other behaviors generally are going to uh, cause you to be significantly impaired in the next two days if you don't change them. Um, and you often have months or weeks or sometimes years, but eventually you may change them. But now we're in a pandemic, and a pandemic really does warrant us to try to do things in a much faster mode because this is when we can help each other the most. Um, we hopefully won't be in this pandemic forever. Uh, and hopefully we will have a much easier time in the pandemic because we've been actively working to help each other uh, every step of the way by doing all of the things that we're always talking about up here. So a lot of the, uh, the kind of uh, campaign is going to come out on so many different types of media and much of it appropriate for certain demographics within our society, P people of certain age or sex or background or what have you. Uh, because we need to do what appeals to them. Um, the difference here, though, is we have to do this in a very rapid fashion, just like we had to get testing up <clears throat> very, very quickly, because it doesn't do any good if you don't have it when you need it. Uh, so all of this is just on a very advanced timeline. Um, so there won't be as much time to get all of the data and all of the data that we need, because we have to sort of do things very, very quickly but it will be appear apparent all around you. Uh, but uh, depending on who you are and 
what age you are or what have you. You may not see it all just because it's not coming out towards you. I think you had a question for the governor as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's funny that you mentioned um, um, cigarette or tobacco cessation uh, because, I mean, you can judge that by the uh, decline in sales of cigarettes at $10 a pack. But on the other hand, uh, a lot of smokers realized that they could roll their own with a machine for approximately five cents a piece. Um, so the numbers are, 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 you know, don't always belie what's really happening. Um, but Governor, if I may, um, with the numbers being so good and we're, we're opening, you know, more and more, uh, don't you think that the spigot could be opened, uh, opened a little more to, uh, to allow these businesses to uh, try and come back on their own rather than, you know, uh, have to jump through all these hoops to try and get uh, essentially a welfare check? Yeah, if I, if I did, uh, Steve, I would open it. So we're not there yet? We are, you know, every, every week, uh, I think we get a little bit better. But then we have, you know, there's some concerns. We have an outbreak. Uh, we see some of the numbers growing in other states and so forth. So it gives me a little bit of pause. And uh, I'm just trying to be cautious, methodical, and not go backwards. The, the last thing I want to do is go to a, get to a point where we say, like Arizona has, uh, has done and, and Texas has had to do, and start closing businesses again. Uh, I'd rather continue to move forward rather than retreat. Sure, I can see that. And and uh, you mentioned that you would be okay with someone painting liberty and justice for all. Um, would freedom and unity be okay? Yeah, that's our motto, as you know, Steve. So, <laughs> you know, if you want to go to the city council and present that, we'll see what they have to say. Yeah, but if you abbreviated it, it would show that our uh, forebears had a sense of humor that we probably still don't get. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Joe Barton. Take care. Hello. Um, you spoke earlier about uh, colleges opening up, and uh, given the fact that it appears that many of the increases in COVID cases um, in states where we're seeing large surges are among a younger population. Um, have, have so, has the thought been given to uh, recommendations to colleges when they open? And if so, um, what kind of advice are they being given at this point? Yeah, there, there's going to be a whole host of uh, restrictions and guidance put into place. Uh, they've been working on this with uh, with Rich Schneider, who is a former president of, uh, of uh, Norwich University, leading the charge, so to speak, and working with the, uh, a number of uh, uh, colleges and university presidents and so forth, uh, along with our health department and our um, uh, ACCD team in uh, developing these guidelines. So we, we're getting very close uh, to making those public, uh, but, um, but I would say probably, I would say sometime next week, uh, if we uh, we continue down this path, we're getting closer and closer to being able to do that. But there's going to be a whole host of uh, restrictions, Joe. Well, very good. Um, also, uh, I've been following the Agency of Education's uh, regulations regarding the opening of uh, elementary through high schools um, in the fall, and it's clear that um, these are going to require schools to put out a lot of money that was never anticipated in earlier budgets. Um, I know that the legislature asked the secretary to wait uh, until, I guess, today to submit a request for funds to the federal government. Um, how much, well, this is a, how much are you asking for? How much do you hope and expect to get 
to support um, things like uh, masks, disinfectant, and all the many other uh, unexpected expenses that are going to come with reopening schools. Uh, Secretary French. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, we did, uh, I would say the school districts received approximately $50 million uh, in the legislature's action uh, last week um, through the coronavirus relief fund. Uh, so we're working to uh, turn that guidance on so we can get those funds out for the summer uh, reopening class. Uh, to your comment about the federal government delay, um, the request wasn't that we delay our request to the federal government because we received approval separate pot of money altogether, what we call the ESSER fund, the Elementary and Secondary Education Relief Fund. Um, we're in the process of putting that application out to school districts as well, so they'll have additional funds. But the immediate uh, needs for reopening schools will be met through the Coronavirus Relief Fund uh, appropriated by the legislature, and that's approximately $50 million. Thank you very much. Ethan, Burlington Free Press. Ethan, Burlington Free Press. Hi, can you hear Yeah, we can hear you now, Ethan. Uh, yeah, this is a question for uh, Governor Scott. I'm with uh, the State Auditor Hoffer's recent report on Warren Care Vermont. Yeah, you, you've faded. We got the auditor of okay. one care. Yeah, I was just curious about your thoughts on the, the recent report he released. Yeah, I'm, I'll ask uh, Secretary Smith to comment on that. Mm -hmm. Actually, I thought it was a, I, I want to be complimentary to the report. I thought it pointed out some areas that uh, we need to improve on. Obviously, the two recommendations were to the Green Mountain Care Board and not to the agency. I, he, I understand it's going to be a series of reports that are uh, coming out. But, the, you know, I've always said this. If there's room for improvement, um, we're looking for room for improvement. And there were two recommendations in that report that, uh, like I said, uh, again, were to the Green Mountain Care Board. But I think generally um, we need to sort of look at how we're improving our all-payer model, our structure as we have put together the all-payer model, and the ACO as we, as we move forward. As you know, I asked for more transparency um, at the ACO level, um, operating as a nonprofit to apply to the uh, Internal Revenue Service as a nonprofit. Uh, I believe they're in the process of doing that, but even if they don't get that, um, uh, designation to actually operate uh, in the disclosure like a, uh, a nonprofit with the 990. So um, I don't have any qualms with what the auditor said in that report. I thought it was uh, I thought it was informational. I thought the findings were fine, um, and we have to uh, correct some of the things that he, he had mentioned in that report. That concludes the, um, the questions. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, before we sign off, I wanted to let you know that there will be no pre press conference uh, this Friday in observance of the 4th. And it's hard to believe um, that uh, we've already had about um, 15 weeks of this, three times a week, two-hour briefings. Uh, so starting next week, we're going to move to Tuesdays and Fridays at 11. So with that, I hope everyone enjoys this holiday weekend. Please remember to be smart, uh, be safe, uh, and help everyone uh, stay healthy and, uh, in order to keep our economy open and rolling along. So again, I thank you all for tuning in. Uh, change in the, in the time or in the, uh, the days. It'll be Tuesdays and Fridays uh, after we get back from our little break. Thank you very much.